So we're so pleased to be partnering tonight for tonight's event with UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center. <laughs> I want to introduce Jason Marsh to talk a little bit more about the Greater Good Science Center. So. Thanks so much. Thanks to Evan and the Booksmith team for co-hosting this event with the Greater Good Science Center. Uh, we have been partnering on events for years. They've been fantastic partners. This is the first event we have done in person period, with Booksmith and beyond since the start of the pandemic. So thank you all so much for, for being part of this. So how many of you before this event, before this evening, knew, the, knew of the Greater Good Science Center, or heard of the Greater Good Science Center? All right, 92%. That's pretty good. That is not surprising uh, here. We are on our, our home turf. Um, so for the handful of you who don't already know about the Greater Good Science Center, we are different than a lot of centers at Berkeley and elsewhere in that while we do support some research, most of what we do is we take research on the roots of compassion, empathy, altruism, awe, and we turn it into resources that make that research practical and accessible to people outside of academia. It's what we call the science of a meaningful life, and we turn that science into tools that people can actually apply, especially in education, in healthcare, in parenting. And we do that through a variety of channels. So that includes Greater Good, our online magazine that reaches about a million people a month, um, our programs for educators and parents, online courses, our podcast, all basically serving this goal of disseminating the research, making it feel as practical and applicable to everyday life as possible. And part of that work involves events. Uh, day-long events, workshops, big conferences, and often uh, book events like these where we are bringing together and featuring some of the top leading thinkers uh, on the science of a meaningful life, helping them share their ideas and engage with the public. And tonight, of course, we have two of the leading thinkers, top thinkers, who we could possibly uh, imagine and, and, and bring to you all. So um, first, you know, I have the honor of introducing the person in Berkeley who might in some ways be least in need uh, of an introduction and in that his work is already so familiar and meaningful to so many of you. Um, you know, for journalists, a lot of them really aspire to maybe make a modest impact on perhaps one social issue or have some slight shift in public consciousness on some pressing social or, or political matter. And Michael Pollan has done that in really significant ways, not just once, but twice. First, uh, through books like The Botany of Desire and The Omnivore's Dilemma and In Defense of Food, uh, has had huge impact on the way that people understand food systems and the implications of their own food choices. Uh, and then more recently, um, in, in his books like um, How to Change Your Mind, and this is your mind on plants, he's really helped to catalyze uh, public reappraisal and a deeper public understanding of psychedelics and other drugs. And along the way, his book, six of them have been New York Times bestsellers. Three of them were immediate, number one New York Times bestsellers. Um, and so his work and his writing in the New York Times Magazine and through his books has had huge impact um, across the nation and around the world. And then along the way, he has also had a huge impact locally as a faculty member, as a professor at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism, where he was the director of the Knight Program in Science and Environmental Journalism, mentoring and inspiring hundreds of students through the school, uh, myself included. Um, and then more recently, he has been with Dacker, the co-founder of the Berkeley Center for the Science of Psychedelics, uh, which is now conducting research and training and public education programs that are getting off the ground. I would encourage you all to check it out and sign up for their newsletter, free newsletter, um, as that science really takes off as well. And so tonight, of course, Michael's gonna be in conversation with Dacker Keltner about Dacker's new book, Awe, The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. Uh, so I've been working with Dacker at the Greater Good Science Center for more than 20 years. And when I first met Dacker, 
um, I was in awe, like so many people, of course, of his hair. <laughs> but over the last 20 years, um, I have also really consistently been awed by his generosity and his commitment to his family, to his colleagues and friends, to his students, and to the greater good, both small g greater good and big g greater good. And I've also been awed by his consistently groundbreaking research and prolific output. Um, and so that has meant that he has conducted uh, pioneering research on what we call the science of a meaningful life and published hundreds of papers on topics like compassion, happiness, laughter and love, uh, and then also the uh, the psychology of power and how power and status affects how we treat others. And of course, he has conducted pioneering research on awe, really establishing it as a topic taken seriously by psychology and the sciences and really helping to launch a whole line of research uh, over the past 20 years. Um, and he has, for all of this research, communicated it widely and effectively through a number of channels, including a top popular social psychology textbook and best-selling books, Born to be Good and The Power Paradox. And over these past 21 years, he served as the founding faculty director of the Greater Good Science Center, which has included being the co-instructor of our Science of Happiness online course, which has reached more than half a million students worldwide, and is the host of our Science of Happiness podcast, uh, which I should mention as well, uh, currently includes a series of five episodes on awe. Um, and so now Dacker has just published his new book covering a lot of his research and really groundbreaking thinking on awe. Um, and I am really excited to welcome Dacker and Michael. Hope you all join me in welcoming Dacker and Michael to the stage to talk about awe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. What a nice big crowd. Um, it's a privilege to be here celebrating my friend and colleague's wonderful new book. Uh, you're in for a treat if you haven't read it yet. It's just such an unusual combination of um, you know, scientific research, reporting over a great range, you know, from San Quentin to uh, you know, the wilds of the Sierra to, I mean, it just takes you, it takes you many places. It's a, it's really an achievement. So, uh, I'm delighted to be here in conversation with Dacker. Um, Dacker, I'm going to start by asking you to kind of psychoanalyze me a little bit. Um, <laughs> I love doing that. <laughs> so, last week I was in Iceland. Uh, Judith and I, my wife and I, were in Iceland, uh, and I had two awe experiences, at least two awe. I, uh -huh. I, I probably had three or four, but there are two I want to talk about, because um, they're really different, and I'd like to get your take on them. So the second night in Iceland, we were in Reykjavik, and uh, we're in the bar, and uh, suddenly someone screams out, Northern Lights, <laughs> which I see is like the cover of this book. <laughs> And everybody runs outside without paying their bills, and the bartender chases <laughs> after us. You must settle up first. And uh, Judith and I head, headed down to the water where there was the least amount of light pollution and looked up and saw the most awesome sight yeah. that I think I've seen, mm. which was these, uh, these swirls of dancing green light um, uh, over the water. And it, it really does... It's, it feels transformative. It just, yeah. it just takes yeah. you out of yourself. And um, I was literally awestruck. Uh, it was a 10 on the awe meter. And, um, <laughs> and I felt like I was in the presence of something big and mysterious. Then two days later, a completely different kind of experience. Um, we went to a Pussy Riot concert. Um, the Pussy Riot. I hope you can make sense of this. So, yeah. <laughs> They've ended up in Iceland, or they're in Iceland for a while. They've escaped Russia. One of them actually is still in jail, I think. And um, it was a benefit for Ukraine. Yeah. And they were 
they were incredible, actually. I mean, it's, it's not my kind of music, it's, it was, um, uh, but it was, and it was kind of an assault. But the, the, the moral clarity, I mean, yeah. and the fierceness of these women and their courage, I mean, they have been arrested time after time after time. And this was another kind of awe. Yeah. Um, so mm, same, you know, two very different events, yeah. similar emotion. Yeah. Uh, so what was going on? Yeah, um, it, it's one of the magical properties of this incredible emotion that Einstein thought was maybe our most fundamental emotion that other people have talked about as a basic state of consciousness. Um, that awe is, comes from many different sources. Uh, we can talk about our work in 26 different countries that really identify what we call eight wonders that give rise to awe. Uh, and your two examples fit nicely into two of them. So which two are they? Uh, nature and yeah. just our marveling at the sky and the mysteries of the sky, uh, which have been a source of cosmology and religion and philosophical insight for millennia, and then cultural expression through music, right? Um, and what they have in common, I think, is the fundamental property of awe, uh, and, and in some sense, um, in need of today, which is to kind of relate the self and our way of being in the world to things that are larger than the self, right? Cultural ideas expressed in Pussy Riot's music, uh, the nature of light in the sky. Um, and so that would be my psychoanalysis of your two experiences of awe. It's interesting. I would have put the Pussy Riot concert, because I didn't especially like the music, in, uh, in another category you talk about, which is moral beauty. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? Yeah, this was, you know, um, there are all kinds of misconceptions about awe, and, and in part that's why we do scholarship. Um, people tend to think of it as a, a, an emotion that's primarily about nature, which is true, and there's a great nature tradition in, the, in awe. Uh, perhaps it's a spiritual emotion, but in our, our study of 26 different countries where we really gathered stories of awe from countries as different as Mexico and India and China and Japan, uh, really gathering these rich narratives about this experience, and the most common source of awe is moral beauty, is where you are struck move to tears, you get goosebumps, even even talking about it can bring on these emotions uh, about kindness, uh, you, know, uh, you know, stories of people sharing clothing and food and so forth, uh, courage. One of my favorite stories was from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 1973. Uh, a son went into a bar uh, with an African-American friend, 1973. Some a uh, customer used the N-word, and the son's dad, who was the bartender, threw the guy out of the bar, right? And just had this courage to confront racism at the time. Uh, special talents, overcoming obstacles. Uh, so it's striking to me that um, this, this mysterious emotion, uh, its deepest provenance is the goodness of other people, right? Uh, and that tells us something fundamental about how we build moral communities, that we have these moral, inspiring responses to these kinds of moral beauty. Um, and uh, Pussy Riot would be a good example, you know, fighting for justice uh, and... And, uh, and putting themselves at such risk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, courage, yeah, courage is a... Um, so maybe before we go any further, you should offer, a, a, offer us a definition of awe. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's one of these ironies where um, the... Uh, people really have hesitated, and I think that's why the science of awe is really recent. How can you, how dare you define awe? If you define it, you lose its mystery. Uh, and that's despite the fact that people have been writing about awe for millennia, often pathologically so, you know, nature awe, spiritual awe, psychedelic awe, etc. cetera. Uh, and so science begins with definitions. Um, and we, uh, Jonathan Haidt and I, in 2003, consulted a lot of the spiritual traditions writing about awe, the transcendent experiences in the Upanishads, the great writings in that tradition, and in particular the philosophical traditions of Edmund Burke, this Irish philosopher, who said that awe, uh, what he called the sublime, is about power or vastness and obscurity. The mind can't make out what you're seeing. And so, I de we defined awe in slightly more contemporary terms as vast things, and I know there's gonna be a hand out there like, 
What about the small things that give you all, like looking into a microscope? Fair enough, you know. There are always counterexamples. Uh, so it's vast and it's mysterious. It, you just can't make sense of it um, with your current knowledge. And so I think vast mystery gets us close. So vastness, de define vastness if you would. Yeah. Because, I mean, we all know what it means, but, the, but where's the vastness in the, the courage of Pussy Riot? Where's the, you know, how does vastness figure in moral beauty? Yeah, you know, so I think the latest thinking is our minds uh, move through the day sort of calculating regularities in the world, that, and we have this frame of reference of what we expect to see based on those computations, if you will, and then vastness exceeds that frame of okay. reference, right? And so we have ideas about the courage that it would take to stand up to injustice, and then when you hear about a musician that's willing to go to prison, that's of a different scale, right? right? And so it's, it's big. And so, so it's a scale question, yeah. really, and, and it's this idea that your, your usual way of proceeding that just doesn't work, right? It's yeah. It's short-circuited. Yeah, yeah and, and, there, you know, and, and this brings in all kinds of absurd examples of awe. Like if you, how many of you have stood next to a person who's seven feet tall? Yeah. You're just like, I, I can't talk, you're a giant, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, it's, it, 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 tra it transcends our ordinary experience, and, and that's when awe begins. Yeah. Um, it's a universal emotion, you say. Yeah. Yeah. And that struck me. I never thought of awe as an emotion, actually, yeah. until I started talking to you about it. It seemed like an experience, not an emotion. But, but it's universal, yet it's harder to explain than other emotions that are so clearly adaptive and contribute to yeah. our survival and success, like um, uh, fear or disgust. Or, yeah. So what good is it? What's, its, you know, what's it good for? Why, why has it been preserved in evolution, would you say? Yes, that's the journalist question. What good is all? You know, <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know, man. It's you. Know, uh, <laughs> you do know. It's good you to study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's a big question. And as we started to do the science of awe about 15 years ago, there was really a deep shift in evolutionary thinking about the human species, uh, kind of culminating E.O. Wilson the social conquest of the earth, or whatever his, the title was, meaning um, we are a hyper-social species. We are the most social mammal uh, that's ever existed, the most social species. We synchronize with others, we mimic others, we know others, people, other people's minds. Big chunks of the brain are, are devoted to that. And we promoted this at the greater good, which is every survival-relevant task in our hominid evolution, we accomplished socially. Uh, we raised offspring in networks of people providing care. We defended ourselves. We faced food scarcity, which was a fundamental shaper of human evolution and food and mm -hmm. preferences socially. Um, we even dealt with- You're talking with, about through hunting and then agriculture. And, right, yeah. you know, and even with cold. We're, we're a particular kind of social mammal that huddles when it gets really cold, right? And we share warmth. It's just built into us. And what that means is in the context of our evolution, we needed a variety of adaptations that help us be members of communities, to help us share, to sacrifice. And awe has all those features, right? It's so fascinating, you know, when you experience the Northern Lights in Iceland, there's probably part of your mind that was saying, I see a pattern in the sky, but I'm actually part of a community. Hmm. These people around me, I care for more. That doesn't make sense in some sense semantically because it's a pattern in nature triggering a belief about your social world. But that's a regularity of awe. So awe. But there was a desire to share the experience and there was a whole lot of chatter about it. Right. And afterwards. Yeah. And so awe. We all felt privileged that we had this opportunity. And you probably were proposing camping trips and, you know, yeah. creating a political party <laughs> around Michael Pollan and, you know. So, yeah, it's just this collective emotion that helps us uh, do the things we need to do as a collective species. So it's pro-social, even when it's an individual experience. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we have funny studies of that. You take students to the Berkeley eucalyptus trees, they look up into the trees for a minute, and then another part of the, uh, an experimenter walks by and stumbles and drops all these pens. And when you look up at the trees, you're like, 
I'll help that guy, you know, and there you go. Uh, I love that experiment. I know. You told me about that. Yeah, it's so, so great. it makes you generous and profoundly so. And you suggest it also, though, is an antidote for narcissism and egotism. How does that work? Why should that kind of experience, and how did you prove that? Yeah, so, you know, one of the, um, one of the really fascinating things um, in, in doing this book is, you know, it's humbling to study awe with science, and you're like, you know, like, how much awe did you feel, Michael? Is that a seven or an eight? And you're like, ah, you know. So um, I read a lot of awe writing, and there are spectacular traditions of awe writing. Uh, the spiritual journaling and writing, um, Julian of Norwich, right? And writing about her relationship to Jesus, one of the first books written by a woman in English, she uses the phrase, I am nothing, uh, I think 14 times. It just, it comes out of our experiences of awe. Emerson, in one of his famous quotes, you know, all mean egotism vanishes. vanishes yeah. I even quote Michael in one of his psychedelic experiences, I can't remember what it, it was, DMT or... It was psilocybin. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, were you were the post-it notes? Yeah, when I... Yeah, detonate. Michael's like, myself is like a bunch of post-it notes, and they all vanish when I'm on feeling psychedelic awe. Um, and that's a fascinating part of this experience, is the, the dissolving of the self. And so we did a bunch of crazy studies to, you know, to be part of this conversation about ego dissolution. Um, one of my favorites is... We stopped, uh, we got it, um, there's a highway that goes into Yosemite Valley, and at the first lookout, we positioned a bunch of researchers led by Yang Bai from China, and like people were like, whoa, hold on a second, fill out a questionnaire. And, <laughs> and, and as part of the questionnaire, we were like, this is sophisticated science, draw yourself. So in the awe ex ex condition, they drew tiny little selves, right, compared to, Another one. I have to tell you, my I other favorite. I know my other favorite one is we did this awe walk study, where once a week we got people who are 75 years old or older to do an awe walk, to go find awe wherever they walk, and while they were doing it, we had them take a selfie, and in the awe condition, the self starts to get smaller and it starts to fade out of the picture. Right? They can't like <laughs> they're off the picture. So the awe, the sense of self dissolves with awe and in the brain as well with the default mode network. That's big news because a lot of people... You have to back up a little. So, I mean, what's the default mode network? And yeah, yeah I was gonna ask you what's going on in the brain? What yeah. do we know during yeah. an awe experience? Yeah, you know, we um, often, we can rely on neuroscience when our measures may cause a little bit of doubt, right? If it can really register in neurophysiological patterns, that's another kind of evidence to speak to a claim. And um, the default mode network is this fascinating couple of chunks in your brain, massive chunks in the front and the side, the posterior cingulate cortex. And they really seemed, that, those chunks seem to be involved in the self, right? Self-representation, staying on task, keeping track of my status and the like. And different kinds of awe quiet down the default mode network, right? Musical awe, nature awe, psychedelic and psychedelics, awe. Psychedelics, yeah, yeah, that was one of the findings. So that's really interesting. It starts to converge with the impressionistic reports of like, God, when I feel awe, I just disappear. I feel like I'm nothing, like Julian of Norwich. And here we're seeing it in, in the brain as well. Um, so, uh, and what I really find encouraging is, especially for young people, is a shift away from the self, right? It's a narcissistic era with selfies and, and so forth. And here's an emotion for a minute or two where you can kind of quiet that chatter, which is good news. Really good news and politically relevant too, yeah. right? I mean, given the rampant egotism and narcissism in our society. So you've been on this beat, as we would say in journalism, for 20 years. Uh, when did you write that piece with John Haight? I think it was 2003. So. Yeah. Why awe? How did you, I, I'm kind of curious to know your kind of intellectual biography that took you to awe, and um, and what were some of the big aha moments? Yeah. Since you started working on it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, sometimes when you write a book, um, you you know, 
I am a scientist, so I write about the science. Um, and I was humbled writing this book because I think you need other kinds of scholarship, um, which William James wrote about stories, and I interviewed a lot of people. Um, and then, you know, some books get really personal. And uh, I, in writing this book, um, realized I was kind of raised as a, as a wild child. I was raised in a, a context of awe. You know, my mom uh, taught literature and romanticism and Shelley and Virginia Woolf and Wordsworth, who figures prominently in this book, and was just filling our house with that. And my dad was a painter, still is. Um, loved Goya, who was right on that border of horror and mm -hmm. awe. And Francis Bacon and his fleshy paintings. You know, he painted us all the time. I, you know, I grew up in Laurel Canyon in the late 60s. Uh, I was kind of meant to study awe, and, and, <laughs> and I had to come to Berkeley to do it, you know, because um, then I could say, come on, man, I'm at Berkeley, I get to study awe, you know, so, uh, so that was part of it, um, and um, part of it was uh, just the mystery of it, you know, like, if we have the tools of science, of the brain and measurement and the voice and how it affects our sense of self, can we get close to really one of the great mysteries about human beings is this capacity. Um, what, what are the big aha moments? Um, one is Jane Goodall, um, who observed awe in chimpanzees. I write about it. And she said, I think this is primate awe and the beginning of mammalian spirituality. And I agree. I think she was writing about the goosebumps, uh, pyloerection, very old mammalian response. So she could see that in her chimps yeah. when they saw what? It was a waterfall? Waterfalls, large storms. Franz de has later observed, the great primatologist, you see this fluffing up of the fur and almost reverential behavior when friends, chimpanzee friends, pass by and they merge together, right? So it's this merging of self with others. So, so you think it's pro-social among chimps too? Yeah, I think it's this transcendent this structure to awe that begins in primates that's about, I'm way more than this separate self, I'm way more than my unique desires, I'm merging with others around me for evolutionary benefit. I think that's a big aha moment. The moral beauty really struck me um, that, and also moral beauty, the, the idea that, that what we revere most is just ordinary kindness and courage that's all around us. Um, and, and that struck me, that we, we've got to open our eyes to that. And the third is really striking, um, is we, serve, we did this method. Um, there are different ways that you capture experience. It's very hard in psychological science. I'm not sure you ever can, uh, but we try. And one method is called the daily diary experience. And you get people at the end of the day to report on whether they had an experience or not. And we did this study in Japan, China, Barcelona, the United States, with different collaborators. Did you have an experience of awe, right? Um, we did it for two weeks, and when we analyzed the data, uh, people are experiencing awe two to three times a week, right? So it's this everyday experience. Um, you know, Descartes felt that it was just a basic state of consciousness is awe, and I think there's something to that, that it's there if we can clear away stuff to feel. You think there's more or less awe around today? I mean, if you did that historically, right, and you had done those diaries 20 years ago, <laughs> we go on, you know, where's, where's this market in awe? Yeah, I, you know, uh, or 500 years ago, right, in the Renaissance era, or, yeah, you know, um, and, you know, uh, I, I think in some ways uh, it's, it's the best of times for awe. One of the heroes of the book is William James, who in writing about mystical awe says it can come from anywhere. And I think in our survey data, people find awe from everything, you know, the mechanics of a watch, you know, my, my uncle's jokes that he tells, you know, the trees outside, the redwood trees. So in some sense, we're free to feel awe. But we're also spending more time on phones and right. screens, which seem to me yeah. uh, 
you know, diminishing our opportunities. You know, we, we don't look around when we're yeah. waiting online. Yeah, I agree. We look uh, at our phones. So and I think the tech... Phone, I mean, can you have awe on a phone? Depends whose phone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think technology has a lot to offer for. You know, in our survey of, of uh, 26 different countries, um, no one mentioned Facebook as a source of awe. <laughs> no one mentioned a Google search or Google Maps. Uh, no one mentioned virtual reality. So I think, it's, I think technology gets in the way of awe. Um, and then I think that our, what technology and, and more broadly these, the cultural conditions of today of task-focused, hyper-competitive, working harder, we've lost a lot of wandering uh, in our lives that we mm -hmm. need for awe to, to think of. So, so I think it's complicated. I think we have the capacity to feel more awe and probably less than 30 or 40 years ago. I'm curious how um, culturally constructed these experiences are. I yeah. mean, you know, before the Romantic era, mountains, which are now a source of awe, yeah. right, were considered just ugly, de yeah. deformities on the earth. Yeah. Um, and that suggests that what inspires awe may change over time, yeah. right? I mean, so it's a universal emotion, but does it have, does it, does it uh, manifest differently in different cultures? Profoundly so, you know, and, and, and I think that the structure of awe of, I encounter these vast mysteries, uh, I feel what William James called saintly tendencies to serve, my mind is open to wonder, to figure out why this is mysterious. That's a structure you see in a lot of uh, awe experiences across the culture, but um, it's radically culturally constructed, um, both across cultures and across historical periods. Um, Any you examples know, of like a culture that finds yeah. awe in something we don't at all or vice versa? So in China, um, awe is felt very regularly for teachers. And if you ask the average American teacher, do your <laughs> students feel awe for you? Not happening. <laughs> you know, and, and p people in positions of um, higher up in the hierarchy. We have a rather pathetic or tragic finding. In the United States, college students feel awe 9% of the time about themselves. <laughs> They're like, man, I got this new fellowship. You see my photo on Tinder? It's amazing, you know. <laughs> And that's individualism that's ruining awe, right? <laughs> so, but it gets deeper, and this is what's fascinating about it, um, and it is this cultural particularity, personal particularity, and also linked to the universal. It's a great exercise you can do with, uh, if you have friends at a gathering, you can say, tell me about an awe-inspiring awe experience with music, mm -hmm. right? And someone will say, oh man, it was the Grateful Dead, Someone else will say hip hop. Then there's the Garth Brooks fan, and you're like, I can't, I can't believe that, you know. <laughs> but somehow, there's this universality to it. So embedded within it is all kinds of, of miraculous variation, which is which is wonderful. You yeah, know, and it, it makes is. it fascinating. Oh, it's great. It's great. Um, so, what's what's there, an experience of awe uh, in music for you? Well, there was that Grateful Dead concert when I was in 10th grade. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, it was like, um, it started at midnight and <laughs> went into five in the morning. Wow. And there were moments of, and I, no drugs were involved. <laughs> um, it was just the music. Um, so going to Iceland and seeing the uh, Northern Lights is an expensive form of yeah. awe. Yeah. Is awe equitably uh, distributed in our society? I mean, you know, a lot of the things we think of as classic awe experiences involve going to Yosemite, leisure time, all this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. is this, is there, is there inequality built into awe experience? Yeah, you know, um, one of the, I think, big misconceptions that I hope you leave uh, tonight uh, with, uh, dis by disabusing is awe is rare and rarefied, uh, it's actually all around us, you know, and as in our, some of our research, the more people practice awe, the more they just feel it in all kinds of experiences, um, out in nature, out in the world, um, you know, what uh, Soren Kierkegaard, the great philosopher, called the chance encounters with the significance of insignificant things, and so awe is just all around us, right? It's not rare. 
A second big misconception is that... So do people have to be trained to see it? Yeah. I mean, and you can train up to quiet your mind, not label things, uh, resist analyzing, go to things that ask questions. Rachel Carson, the great environmentalist writer, has a great essay on how to teach your child to feel awe uh, with these kind of techniques. The other big misconception is you, when you ask people, how, what, what is awe? And, and often it involves like hopping on a plane, emptying the bank account, getting to the yeah. barrier reef. Um, and in fact, that's not true. You don't need resources to feel off. Um, you, you, um, you know, there's empirical work showing the more resources people have, the less awe they actually feel, hmm. right? Which is per provocative. Maybe resources get in the way of awe. I'm not sure how much awe people actually feel on really expensive vacations anyway, right? They're fighting with their spouse or whatever it is. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think one of the lessons of this book is it's, it's, and this is a lesson of William James and Ralph Waldo Emerson and others is, yeah, just go get it. It's right, right around this. So it's about perspective as much as the content of your experience. Yeah. It's how you look at it. Yeah. That idea of not categorizing, not naming is really interesting too. Yeah. What's, what's behind that? Why is it helpful not to name things? Yeah, I think, you know, and it's a deep philosophical idea. You know, a lot of Buddhist traditions, right? The skepticism of words and labeling. Uh, labels are great for many things, but I think that awe needs mystery. And words kind of circumscribe phenomena. Um, and, and one of the things that I learned in writing this book, and I think it's true of a lot of places in our culture, is we shy away from mystery. We love things we know and that we're certain about. Uh, and awe needs to destabilize your knowledge. It needs to really challenge words and concepts and, and truisms and the like. And, and so that's a good mindset uh, element to find So awe. what you're saying makes me think a lot about psychedelic experience, which you do deal with in the mm. book. And I'd love to have you read a passage about it. But psychedelics, uh, I, I really wish I had read this book before I wrote my book on psychedelics because awe is a very interesting framework in which to yeah. understand psychedelic yeah. experience. But, you know, it's chemically induced awe. Is that cheating? <laughs> <laughs> no. <you know. laughs> They're amazing chemicals. Like, you know, like if I do a sauna and I turn it up to 200 and I feel awe, is that cheating? No. You know, one of the one of the really interesting discoveries for me in the aha moment is culture does aha. And there's awe everywhere and all kinds of words. So the awe spa, no, whatever. <laughs> so don't do that. But um, we create a lot of venues and, and, and ways to feel awe as a, as a cultural species. We chant. How many of you sing in it together with other people? Or do we have any, it's so awe-inspiring, right? We dance and, and we create compounds that, that uh, bring us awe, so it isn't cheating. It's, I'm so uh, glad to hear that. Yeah, so. It's a legitimate technology of awe. It is a technology of awe. Right. So um, there is a, a, a wonderful passage in the book. There's so many, but there's a wonderful passage about psychedelic experience. And um, I think to understand it, we have to know a little bit about your brother. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, um, along in this wild childhood that I had, which I feel very privileged about and wish I'd given more to my daughters, um, I had all these amazing experiences with my brother Rolf, who was one year younger than me. We were born in Mexico. Um, you know, he's a big redheaded guy, grew up in Laurel Canyon, moved to the foothills of the Sierras in a very rural, poor setting and, and just had a life of awe as kids, you know, just swam in rivers and wandered and climbed into the mountains and the hills and looked at skies on dirt roads. And, and I, I realized that my parents had kind of pointed at him and I, he and I, in, in a direction of awe. And we just, everything we did was about this, this marvelous emotion. Um, and then he uh, got colon cancer um, and that is a horror show. It's combat, it's brutal. The, he had a very tough version of it. 
I was very close to it and passed away. Um, and his um, passing, the moment that he left, January 26, a few days from now, um, was a moment of awe. Um, watching people die is mysterious, uh, and it's, it's often awesome um, because it's so vast and mysterious. Um, we were all gathered around him. I saw his body. I felt the space felt different. I felt him being pulled into some space I couldn't conceptualize. Um, and then what happened is in the aftermath, I was blown off the map and I was aweless. I couldn't find awe or wonder in anything. And I wrote this book. Um, I went in search of awe. And in part of writing the book, and you and I talked a lot about this, um, his, I was in grief, I felt him all around me as a more biologically, evolutionarily oriented scientist. I couldn't make sense of my experiences. Um, mm. I felt his hand on my back twice, he had very big hands. I literally felt the hand on the back. And I was like, okay, that's a sensation, now I analyze it, still there. Yeah. I heard mm. his voice, I felt him in places. And I just, thanks to your recommendations, wrote it, right? Like wrote that experience. And so my brother and I, um, one of the things I love about Michael Pollan, as Jason said, is he frees us up to, uh, to embrace new cultural m movements. <laughs> and one is psychedelics. And I'm not hesitant at all about saying they changed my life when I was 17 years old. Uh, they have their perils. Uh, and I took them most typically with my brother, Rolf. Uh, one of the times was a great, I'm sorry, I'm going on too long. No, 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 we, no. We were at this, we sneaked in, this is the, we sneaked into this gated community's little lake. This is what we used to do, sneak into bodies of water that we could swim in. We usually get arrested. Uh, <laughs> so we sneak into this lake and we're all in psychedelics and there are all these conservative families around. And my brother, who is like as subversive a comedian as existed, got under all this lake seaweed and like pretended he was a sea monster, like, <laughs> oh! <laughs> and all the families ran away and we were like, woo! <laughs> so that is not what I'm gonna write about, but, um, <laughs> or read. So inspired by Michael and his world-changing work on psychedelics, um, I uh, wanna read, if you don't mind. Please, yeah. And, and this, one of the things that I tried to capture it's in the book. It's on page 211 if you want to read along. <laughs> Thank you. Awe has a structure to it of dissolving self, feeling connected to vast things, finding your compass in life. And a lot of the experiences, including your own psychedelic writings, have that structure to it. Awe mm. is the structure of transcendent experiences in spirituality, music, nature, etc. And so, as I thought about my brother passing and grasped um, uh, and, and wanted to represent the role of awe in psychedelics, I wrote this. One experience of psychedelic awe stays in the cells of my body to this day, a trip Rolf and I made in our early 20s in Zihuatanejo, Mexico, where Timothy Leary escaped to win on the run from the law. We, not, we went on a journey to, to El Faro, the lighthouse, a fitting direction for us. My mom taught Virginia Woolf's transformative to the lighthouse in her classroom. After taking a small boat to the isthmus on whose faraway point El Faro stood, we walked past dozens of red crabs dug into holes, each throwing out radiating balls of sand to mark its territory, which it defended with absurdly large claws and we absorbed their strangeness and beauty. A fallen tree in the sand, perhaps a small manzanita, now gnarled driftwood, reached out to us, its smooth branches leaning, yearning, seeking touch, intending, and aware. On the trail, we walked several miles with a precipitous view of the ocean to our left. The Pacific Ocean was illuminated. Magenta bougainvillea pulsated. Arriving at the lighthouse, sweaty and sun-warmed, we stood inside a small circular space with two windows peering out. The ocean's horizon vanished into pure, refracting light. The room's white walls glowed in the brilliant sun of Mexico. 
A roar of wind and waves surrounded us, echoing, hovering, moving, repeating. On the windowsill sat a piece of pink soap and some rusty nails. What decayed for me that day was the interfering neurotic who tries to run the show. I ex that's Aldous Huxley and right. Michael got me to that. I experienced inexplicable and at times extraordinary sensations, a wind, the embracing powerful sun, the porous boundaries between Rolf and I, entrained rhythms of breathing, side-by-side -side strides, and the regular crunching of footsteps, and a sublime laughter about life's absurdities breaking into fragments of sound that vanished in the wind, the distilling of transcendent feelings of brotherhood. Mm, beautiful, thank you. And Rolf, is, his presence is, is threaded through the whole book, and he becomes this uh, really important character in the story. And, um, and I think that what you say about that and, and his death gives the lie to the idea that this is just a happiness topic and that yeah. you know, awe is, is not just about tourism and you know, <laughs> um, fun experiences, that, that, that awe is something we feel in the face of, of, of mystery and, yeah. and, uh, and death. Yeah. Um, so do you think, as I, read, as I read what you had to say about psychedelics, do you think awe might explain, might be part of the mechanism by which psychedelics have their therapeutic effects. I mean, there's been yeah. a lot of research suggesting that they're very helpful with addiction yeah. and depression and obsession. And um, how would how would that work? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I, sus I suspect there are a lot of people who are thinking about psychedelics. Rightfully so. There, it's a very important movement in our thinking about the mind and our struggles which are high today, 30% uh, mm -hmm. rise in depression after the uh, pandemic. Um, and there's this interesting debate in the literature um, about how do we think about the process by which psychedelics benefits us, and I would add music and singing in a choir and dance and all the things that bring us awe. And you know, one is more of a biological reductionistic account. Oh, it alters serotonin, mm -hmm. right? Serotonin has effects on dopamine, which has effects on the vagus nerve, and I can account for the benefits. And, and I have moved, thanks to our conversations and David Presti and others, away from that, right? That we need the subjective to understand why people change. We are subjective beings where emotions are the drivers of action and shifts in thought. And awe is, I think, going to be, there's a class of transcendent states that I grapple with a bit in the book. Ecstasy and bliss are close to awe, but different. Bliss is where the self just dissolves completely. Awe, you're really aware of your, your relation to something vast in the world, right? Joy, gra gratitude, reverence. I love the absurd, right? The feeling of all of life is absurd and comic, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> which is you know, closely related to self-transcendence. And awe helps us understand why psychedelics work, which is, you transform your sense of self. You have a sense that there are things out in the world, uh, big ideas that you could be part of. It activates this sense of community. So if a veteran is alone in South Dakota and they take psychedelics and it gives them a sense of community, that's awe and it's structures that we've started to document in the lab. And so I think, it's, I think the self-transcendent states will be the story of psychedelics as indigenous traditions have been arguing for yeah, quite, quite some time. time. That's yeah. right. It's also that, that, you know, what you talked about earlier, the way that it, it uh, overturns categories. Yeah. Um, and a lot of what seems to be happening in psychedelic experiences is that people unlearn uh, preconceptions, bad uh, patterns, mm. um, and that they need to kind of be jostled out of the grooves that they're in. And it seems to me that Awe does that as well. Yeah, and I, I love um, the idea, uh, one of my students coined this term, awe is destabilizing, mm -hmm. right? It, you have this experience of awe, uh, and you're like, whoa, the, my basic assumptions about the world can't capture that, they can't make sense of that. You know, and that's why awe is so important in visual art, 
because it destabilizes ideas about gender or power or violence or what have you. And I think that's what psychedelics do in a very profound way, you know, and destabilizing way. And it's, we're vulnerable to that. Yeah. A young child, a, a 22 year old will come back and be like, all of society is faulty and false. You know, <laughs> that's trouble. You got to watch out for that. But that's destabilization. And, and I think it can benefit us in, in many ways. So uh, sticking with the therapeutic uh, idea, I was really struck by the work you did uh, with the veterans and yeah. the rafting, and yeah. that you actually have some evidence of physiological change. Will yeah. you talk a little bit about those trips? Yeah, you know, one of the heroes of this book, and, and I interviewed a lot of people, like Michael said, in prisons, in, in, in orchestras, and visual artists, and the like, is Stacy Bear, who's one of my favorite human beings. He's six foot eight. Uh, he wanted to be in the, the Navy, but he was too tall, so they rejected him. Uh, so he was in the Army, he was in Iraq, um, and a lot of, like a lot of veterans, came back uh, and was suicidal um, and was rock climbing. I was about to kill himself, was out rock climbing thanks to a friend, uh, and he had an awe experience. And a lot of these transformative awe experiences, um, you know, like Jean Jacques Rousseau and spiritual experiences and Darwin, whom I write about, Emerson, etc., Michael Pollan, um, you know, <laughs> Toni Morrison, all kinds of great people. They kind of shake and they vibrate and they suddenly realize the point of life. And Stacy had this loud voice say, get outdoors, right? S solve your trauma of combat. He started to get veterans outdoors in the most awe-inspiring work in part I've ever been around of, you know, guys with no legs who are rock climbing El Capitan, you know, rafting with blind veterans, incredible work. So he and I wanted to capture that scientifically. And so in partnership with the Sierra Club, we did one of my favorite studies, which is uh, they, we got participants to raft down this part of the American River that I had actually rafted with my brother Rolf, which was another synchronicity in the, in the book. And you know, they're rafting, and we had veterans and high school students as part of our samples, you know, the, you know, they're sometimes falling out, getting into splash fights. Totally wild study. Uh, and two really important messages of this. We gathered saliva at the start and end of the study and measured cortisol, a stress hormone. We have we've videotaped their vocalizations and facial expressions, and there's all kinds of synchronized, like, woo, right, which is great. Um, and then we measured how they did a week later. And, and the first finding is... Um, veterans show a 32% drop in PTSD, right? You know, half a day of rafting, doesn't cost a dime, no pharmaceutical intervention. They're all on pharmaceutical cocktails, 32% drop, right? That is significant. Uh, and then the second finding, and, and I love this about awe, is how it, it merges our brains and our bodies. And suddenly, we, like the poet Ross Gay says, the porous boundaries between ourselves and other people just start to dissolve, right? And in this study, everybody's cortisol levels were different at the start of the study, and by the end of the study, they're starting to resemble their raft mates, right? So our bodies are starting to align. And that's one of the cool things about awe is we, we live in this sense that we're separate and isolated, and that's part, partially true but we can sync up fast, mm -hmm. right? Um, in the musical awe chapter, one of my favorite, there's a whole micro literature on rhythm. Every culture has its own rhythm to music, you might imagine. And when nine month olds hear their music of their culture, they all start bobbing with other <laughs> adults around and they're more altruistic to that adult as opposed to uh, an adult bobbing to a different culture's music. So, so that study told us, even at the level of stress hormones, we merge with others. So there's all. the pro-social impact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. I love that study. So I'm going to turn to some questions from the audience. Thank you for your questions. Um, somebody um, wants to know, this was a question I was going to ask, didn't get to. Uh, you've discussed awe as a positive experience, but is there a negative awe? Yeah. And, and I was thinking as I was reading the book, you know, there, is, there was the fascist use of awe, right, yeah. in rallies. And, uh, and people at Trump rallies feel awe. Yeah, very much so. Um, so, what about that? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, 
uh, about a quarter of our experiences of awe, um, and we've got a lot of data on this, are, are right next to horror and terror, right? Wow, I'm gonna die, and it's kind of amazing I'll die, and, and that's horrifying, you know? Um, or um, Stacy Bear was in combat, and there's a lot of awe and terror and horror in combat. Uh, I've worked with a lot of um, medical doctors during the pandemic, and a lot of their awe was right on this boundary of people getting COVID, really sick, and you know, maybe not surviving. It's, it's a miracle, right? It's a mystery how that unfolds. Um, and so that's a very important part of Oz is, but it is different from fear. I think historically, uh, the etymology of awe goes back to eighth and ninth century Norse and Old English, where it was really about dread and horror. And when you read historical accounts of the social conditions of the times, people dying young, lots of plagues and famines and starvation, there's a lot of horror and awe. Mm. And we're in a different period now. But yeah, there are lots of, I worry about this, and I worry, it's already happening. I worry about um, the commodification of awe. I don't think we should commodify it. Uh, and it's, it's pernicious uses, right? That, uh, and one is, you know, Dave Eggers wrote about the Trump rallies early, yeah. just getting out and, the and, and progressive and people probably like a lot of people in this room are like, listen to him talk. How could that ever win an election? But you go see the people, it was electric, right? And so that's interesting is, and you know, is this interesting conversation about how social movements start with electric collective effervescent awe and where do they take us, right? And it's, it's up to us to figure out. There's yeah. a lot of dark off and commodification of it. Uh, let's see. Through your study of awe, have you changed how you live in your life in any small, medium, or large ways? I don't think so, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, you know, one is everyday awe. You know, I heard that. We defined it. You know, it's just there's so much if you just just to experience if you just look at the clouds or listen to people's voices. And, and that's been uh, really wonderful. In writing the book, um, it was fascinating to start with my brother's death and, you know, talking to Michael and he's like, just start writing, you know, just go. And at the start, um, I, ha I had no religious, spiritual training, didn't know a lot about how to approach this truth about life, um, and couldn't make sense of it. And through the science and the writing and narratives, I think it opened my mind to, you know, well, life may continue, as Walt Whitman says. Uh, it goes onward and outward. Um, I don't understand why, but I certainly experience it in these experiences of awe of sensing my brother and being open to quantum possibilities or whatever. So that changed a lot mm. um, through the writing of this um, and other ways too. There's several people who ask a variation on this question. Um, uh, how can awe be cultivated as a practice? Can you give us some tips? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I, I think the first thing is to um, we have become so task focused, you know, we, we Google search to find the specific thing and Google Maps, you know, to, to go to a certain place. And, you know, we developed, uh, a, and in part with Jason, uh, the awe walk. And the awe walk is just get out and wander and wonder and give yourself a breather and look for a little mystery, go to places you don't know. So that's a good uh, mindset. You, is that something you do alone or can you do it with someone else? You can do it with other people, you can do it in an elevator, you can do it in a Burger King line, you know, whatever. It's, it's, it's available to you. Um, so give a little more granularity there. I'm in the Burger King line. Okay. I'm that was, to experience uh, awe. Okay, let's Help put me out right. here. So picture Michael Pollan in the Burger King line. <laughs> and he's like, my friend Dacko thinks I can feel awe here. <laughs> Man, is, was I hoodwinked. Yeah. So, Michael, think about where the, the meat comes from. <laughs> no, so let's pick a better example. Any kind of walk you're doing, yeah. So, 
take some deep breaths, focus on your walk, right? Um, uh, put aside the tendency to, to label things. Here's a good one, comes out of the philosopher Edmund Burke. As you're walking, how many of you go for a regular walk? You can try this, right? Uh, plan it out, pick a place that may be a little mysterious to you, and you know, take some deep breaths, get, become aware of your, your footsteps, which is a classic walking meditation technique. And then start to orient your attention to small things and big things. Hmm. And that's a really neat perceptual exercise, which is, oh, I'll look into the reflection on my glasses and notice what is, what is the nature of a reflection. That's small. Oh, I'm looking at all these faces and how there's synchronicity here and synchronization, right? Small to vast. And then you go to the place and take it in. Um, that's a mindset. And then there are a lot of great uh, techniques for uh, feeling awe. Um, at the Greater Good Science Center, we're building a whole library of them at ggia.berkeley.edu. Tell stories of all. Um, at work, uh, when I was working with medical doctors during the pandemic, I had them last week talk about a moment of wonder and awe in your medical practice. They were watching people die from COVID, not getting to be with their families, horror show. And out of that, there'd be these little slivers of experience, right? Of, wow, that, that patient looked up to me and said, thank you. Tell stories um, uh, of, of awe, um, awe walks, listen to music that, that brought you goosebumps and chills. There's a lot to do to cultivate everyday awe. And ggia.berkeley.edu has a lot of good stuff to do. Yeah, that. there are wonderful practices there. Um, someone asked, you, you addressed some of this, but um, where in the body does awe manifest itself yeah I you know is this it in the heart is it in the head is it in the skin is it you know talk about the physiology of yeah that. thank you and thank you for the question um, you know William James who's a hero in this this book great thinker and you know iconoclast and the like really felt that all conscious life was embodied it really begins in bodily sensations uh, one of my favorite quotes that I stumbled upon to frame the neurophysiology of awe in the body is Walt, Walt Whitman who said later in his life, if the soul is not in the body, where is the soul, right? And there is this subjective life of our sense of wonder and awe in the body. And so, you know, we have wonderful science on this and it's helpful because sometimes people come up to me and they say, you know, I'm not sure if I've ever experienced awe. And we're like, well, tell me, give me an example. Well, you know, um, you know, I was in line and Brad Pitt walked by and I gave him a big hug and we went out to dinner and he invited me to, you know, and off you go. Uh, and, and I was crying and tearing up and, you know, and I'm like, that might be awe, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> and we now have, much like the mystical experience questionnaire, a we checklist, you know, where it's like, do you tear up? How many of you have teared up just quickly at a lot of different things, right? It's kind of embarrassing, isn't it, right? That guy at the four-way stop sign, let me go first, no, no. <laughs> you, you know, people are amazing, you know. Well, the tears are actually a very fascinating, the lacrimal gland is stimulated by the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system, which is a different branch than stress that evolved to help you socially engage. You feel warmth. Uh, in your chest, which may be the vagus nerve, you may vocalize like, whoa, very deeply human universal emotion. And my favorite is the chills, and scientists have distinguished between two kinds of chills. You thought it was one, but there are two. Uh, you can get them at Burger King uh, or whatever it is. But it's, one is the shudder, which is about horror. And when, when uh, in spiritual traditions, when you face the judgmental God, you often shudder in horror. The other is the, goose, is the rush of goosebumps up your arms, your neck, and your back of your head, which is really about awe and merging. Uh, and a fascinating science shows that other social mammals have this piloerection or this tilt, this goosebumps, and also in this weird phenomenon called ASMR, which, which is about finding it in video. Do you ever take in ASMR? I've looked at a couple of them. I was inspired to by the uh, by the book. But why don't you 
tell people what they are. Yeah. It's the weirdest phenomenon. It is. Autonomous sensory meridian response. How many of you know what ASMR is? Oh, wow. If this was a room with 20-year-olds, they'd all be like, love it. <laughs> you know? Do you do the Korean sh shrimp slurping ASMR or, or the ear cleaning ASMR? It's, it's all about <laughs> signs of intimacy, of like eating and smacking your lips and you know, people coming closer to you like, okay, Michael, I'm going to clean your ears with this, this <laughs> Q-tip. Are you feeling chills? Something else. <laughs> I'm not close enough. I'm going to get close to you. So, you know, but is it's that, perverse. Is that an awe experience? It is. And this is back to your question about culture. Like, we're yeah. crazy for awe. We will do anything for awe. You know, including ASMR, but it activates the chills, and and it really is about this sense of like I am merging with others. So is the soul in the body? We'll mm. never know. But as a scientist, I feel like the subjective life of the soul, in the tears, the warmth in your chest, the vagus nerve, the goose tingles, uh, reduces inflammation. By the way, which is very good news for health. Uh, is a pretty interesting profile that says awe opens us up to things that are bigger than the self. That's great. Well, I think we're going to end right there. I think it's a perfect place to end. And uh, I feel like inspired to seek awe, um, if not tonight, tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I hope uh, everyone um, takes something from this book, because it is, the, the subtitle does not oversell it. Uh, the New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Dakar. <laughs>